Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Hey, all right. Everybody over here? Everybody over there? Hey, Macedonia, amen. It's good to be in the house. Uh, thank you all so much for coming out uh, Sunday night and, and last night. It's been beautiful. Uh, we're, we're about to start. I'm going to ask our, our praise team to come on up, and we're going to start worshiping in, in just a minute. But uh, I, I did just want to thank everyone uh, for your prayers. Prayer is one of the reasons why I believe this community is so wonderful. And uh, I, it's my prayer that last night as we experienced just God move in such a powerful way, uh, I've been praying all day that every prayer lifted up last night that God would just answer. So you'll know that God is a God who hears. God is a God who sees. But you have to also understand that he has a will that's far beyond our knowledge or understanding. And so when he does say in his promise that uh, he does have a future for you with a hope and it's for your good, you have to understand that it is for your good. Amen. And that, that future good ultimately is Jesus. He's that future hope. And so I love you all so much. Uh, th this is our, our, our victory praise team, or, 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 or most of them. So why don't you all give them a warm welcome as we begin. Turn on. Let's stand together.
Amen. Uh, y'all can be seated. Y'all sounded so beautiful uh, tonight. And uh, I'm going to ask uh, Brother Tommy if you would come up here. And if you're not aware of who Brother Tommy is, uh, he is uh, one of the managers at CLM. And uh, we have Change Lives Ministries with us tonight. Uh, if you're in Change Lives right now, stand up real quick. You know? Amen. 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 Now, uh, now, some of them cheated because uh, they graduated already. Amen. <laughs> you know, but the, we have some graduates here. And what is amazing is God changes their life. And then God has led them into churches to serve and make a difference. And that is what the gospel is about. Amen. And uh, I, I don't mean to, to also uh, mention, but uh, the, the, the women stood up. But that's a, a, a different thing. It's called Hannah House. Amen. That women from Hannah House is with us tonight. And, and so that is just a really you know, make them feel welcome. You know, man. Amen. It was like... Uh, uh, I, I did devotion with them Monday, and they made me cry. So I told them I'm gonna get them back. And uh, amen. But here's Brother Tommy. I love you, man. Love Thank you. Thanks, Pastor Chris. Good evening. Good evening. Well, I feel at home right here. It seems like uh, I know most all of you guys, and I'm thankful to be here tonight. Now, all day long, I've been trying to not get emotional. Um, you know these men right here. Uh, about three years ago, I came to Change Lives Ministry, and um, four years ago in May, and 30-year uh, alcohol, alcoholic, drug addict, just um, about to die, and I came in there, and what they do at Change Lives Ministry, what we do is we set it up where you can come back to God or be introduced to a relationship with God the Father. Through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, we believe that you can overcome any issues you may have in your life. Yes. And I'll tell you this. You know, I graduated from there, the program, in um, August. October, they asked me to be the transition house manager. And in, I'm sorry, October, they asked me to be the men's manager so from may i was a drunk what it was to october i was the manager of a men's faith-based rehabilitation center it's not to point me out one bit i think i was not even sober by the time we these men came into my life so at the at the re, at the uh um, revival in, in november um, Pastor Chris asked me to do a, a testimony. I thought it was this Wednesday night Bible study. So I go, and I'm sitting there, and I'm so nervous, nervous, and I'm going through my papers, and I'm reading. And, the, you know, Victory Church, the people are coming in, and, and they're filling up. The rows are filling up. They're filling up upstairs, and I'm a nervous wreck. And I get up there, and I'm just like, oh, what am I going to do? And I start to give my testimony. I feel like the Holy Spirit came over me, and I start flipping up papers, and it's like this. And, Pastor Chris, bless his heart, he's back there, he's trying to pick him up. It's on YouTube, you can look at it. And, um, and God bless him, I got done, I ran down to the thing and, and left Pastor Chris to pick up my papers. A short time after that, at the next one, uh, Pastor Doug, I got to speak before he did, and um, I remember being nervous, it was at the, the school over there, and, and, we, and, I, and I had an opportunity to speak, I believe like the Holy Spirit took over again, and I start going and going, I get done, and Pastor Doug said, I didn't know you were going to go that long. Sorry about that. And then he took his watch off and said, you know what? Anybody got anywhere to go? Good, because there's my watch. And, man, we had a revival that night. So why do I say that? It's because these men in my life have made a huge difference. We preach and teach relationships that change lives. Pastor Jack said, come here, kid. I love you. I want to hear you preach. I, did you see what I did with the testimony thing? I can't do that. But, um, and then, you know, all of these pastors, almost all of them have asked me to preach in their, in their pulpits. Listen, Pastor Doug talked about it last night. We serve a big God. He will look right through you and see your heart. 
That's what these men did. So this community is hurting. I saw it last night as each one would come up. Addiction, addiction, addiction. If you came and you're addicted, we have the answer, and it's Jesus Christ. Amen. You can come and talk to us about it any time. There is hope in our community. I promise you that. So as Pastor Chris would say, would you all pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, how would be your name? Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the relationship you offer to us, that we can come to you. When we turn away, we can come back and be revived. We can leave that old lifestyle, Lord. We can come to you. We can humble ourselves and pray. We can seek your face, turn from our wicked ways, and you will hear from heaven. We will be forgiven, and we pray that you'll hear all lands. In Jesus Christ, I pray, amen. Let's stand up and continue to worship. Amen.
the melody you surround me with the song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone I'm no
there was another in the fire standing next to me there was another in the waters holding back the seas and should i ever need reminding of how i've been set free there is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me there is another in the fire All my death that put dead beneath the waters I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore And should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning Either way I won't bow to the things of this world And I know I will never be alone there is another in the fire standing next to me. There is another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding what power set me free? There is a grave that holds no body. And now that power lives in me. There is another in the fire. There is another in the fire. Oh, there is another in the fire. Oh, there is another in the fire. Oh, and I can see the light in the darkness as the darkness bows to him. I can hear the roar in the heavens. As a space between where it's been, I can feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison walls cave in. Nothing stands between us. Nothing stands between us. other name but the name that is Jesus he who was and still is and will be through it all so come what may in this space between all the things unseen and this reckoning I know I will never be alone I know I will never be alone there'll be another in the fire standing next to me there'll be another in the waters holding back the seas and should i ever need reminding how good you've been to me i'll count the joy come every battle because i know that's where you'll be and I can see the light in the darkness as the darkness bows to him. I can hear the roar in the heavens as the space between where it's thin. I can feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison walls cave in. Nothing stands between us. Nothing stands between us. be another in the fire standing next to me there'll be another in the waters holding back the seas and should i ever need reminding how good you've been to me i'll count the joy come every battle because i know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be
Uh, thank you all so much um, for letting us worship in this house. Amen. Uh, it's, it's so wonderful. Um, you know, I'm because uh, you know I'm from Macedonia. You know, uh, I remember a time when churches didn't do this, and it was a competition, and not a body of Christ. And uh, this is beautiful. I have talked to many other pastors in many other areas, and there's nothing like this anywhere. And uh, so I think it's a reflection of the people, of course, but I think it's a heavy reflection of the leaders in the community uh, and where their hearts are at with Jesus. Because wherever your feet are turned, that's what you will reflect. If your feet aren't turned towards Jesus, you'll never reflect Jesus. If you never start with Jesus, you'll never finish with him. And so tonight I wanted to look at just a very beautiful prophecy that the prophet Jeremiah gives the people of Israel uh, out of Jeremiah chapter 2. And then we'll see where the Lord takes us. Amen. I like surprises. Gen uh, Jeremiah chapter 2. And we'll start at verse 1, and we'll read to verse 3, and then we're going to jump down to verse 9. How many of y'all got your Bibles tonight, by the way? Man, that is some cool stuff. Phones are cool, but listen, I just like something to hold, amen, right on, put prayer requests in, uh, you know, this, this is a big thing. We need our word. I try to take this everywhere I go. I don't care if I look weird. Amen. I'm all right with that. Have y'all seen me? I mean, you, know, you know, I don't like, uh, you know. Um, uh, Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, and then we're going to jump down to verse 9. And this is what the Lord spoke through Jeremiah. Oh, awesome, yeah. Let's stand up and read the word. Amen. Yeah, let's stand up. Because I, I don't want, you know, I want y'all to stretch one more time. Because uh, I'm going to take my full amount tonight. Amen. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, and then verse 9. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord, I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness in a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. All who ate of it were held guilty. Disaster came upon them, says the Lord. And jump down to verse 9. Therefore, once more I accurse you, says the Lord. I accurse your children's children. Cross to the coast of Cyprus and look. Send to Kedar and examine the care. See if there has ever been such a thing. Has a nation changed its gods, even though there are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for something that does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. It is shocking. Be utterly desolate, says the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and have dug out cesterns for themselves, cracked cesterns that can hold no water. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word and your spirit. Father, you are always with us. May we always be aware of your presence. God, I ask that you would move my flesh out of the way that the very spirit of Jesus would minister to every heart, mind, and soul here. God, that we would know that we were in your presence. And Father, that we would give to you what you want to take from us, Lord Jesus. You want to take all the dead stuff and the things that cling to us so closely, the sin that holds us back, Lord, that we would give it to you, Lord Jesus, and leave it with you. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I, uh, it's very beautiful. Some people here tonight thought I was not uh, as old as I am. You know, last night I got to stand up and, you know, because I was in the 30 crowd, woo, you know, and, uh, but listen, I'm not going to be there very long. You know, I'm right there on the edge, you know. So some people were really shocked that how young I was, or, or I guess how old I was, you know. 
uh, w- whether you look at that or not. But to tell you this, I have been preaching the gospel for 20 years. Amen. At the, no, 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 uh, no, no, no. I didn't tell you that to get a patty cake, all right? <laughs> I told you that so that you would understand where I am coming from. Amen. I am a young man. I was born in 1982, and I have two older brothers, and that one's nine years and a day older than me, and one is 11 years older than me. So immediately you understand I was a punching bag for a long time, all right? <laughs> for a long time, and they are much bigger and taller than me. It's amazing. I don't know why my parents did this. They had two kids, and they waited nine years later. I was like, let's have two more. And I'm thankful they did that. No, you know, don't, don't get me wrong. You know, and me and my sister was born a little later. And so a lot of people that eat like this either were, uh, had brothers or were in prison. Amen? And uh, so and I, I, uh, I eat like this a lot, you know, because I had two older brothers. And uh, we had just one of those wonderful setups where dad worked and my mother stayed home and on the weekend they dragged me to church that's what they do that's that's where i and i began uh from the womb i was going to victory baptist church the very church i pastor now all right now listen only two ladies there changed my diaper you know (laughs) like, like two ladies you know and one's my mother so you know uh But uh, God works in such amazing and beautiful ways because here I am, this young man from Macedonia, and God changed my life. But you have to understand, it had to start from somewhere because I didn't know what living water was. I didn't know who Jesus was. Even though I went to church all of my life, even though I was dragged to church all of my life, I knew how a Christian looked. They dressed real nice. And they spoke real nice at church. Sometimes they didn't speak nice at church. Amen? Lord, make the bad people good and the good people nice. Amen? Amen? But I didn't, even though I could look like a Christian, talk like one, even walk like one, I didn't have the presence of the living God in me. And so when I hit my teenage years, because I did that whole Baptist thing where, uh, and listen, I'm, I talk a little bit of Baptist stuff tonight, right, Alan? Amen, brother? <laughs> Amen. You know? Uh, so at that Baptist age, most kids, when they turn about 12, you know, their parents are like, so, you know, you're going to make a decision? And, and uh, so uh, around my 12th birthday, I got baptized. And, but I really didn't understand what it meant because I was 12. Listen, 12-year-olds don't know nothing what's going on. They, they don't. You know, you think you're 12 right here. Any 12-year-olds here tonight? I love you, but you're my daughter. And, uh, and, uh, and no, no, you're not my daughter, but I love you too. And uh, amen. But, uh, you know, uh, you might think you know something right now, but I, I didn't know. I didn't have any clue what I was doing. And so when I really hit the years when the enemy in the world really comes after you, and whether you believe it or not, you are being indoctrinated every day through whatever you watch, whatever you listen to, wherever you go, whatever you see, whatever advertisement catches your eye, you are being indoctrinated every day. And so uh, I was indoctrinating myself into the paths of evil, and I didn't even know it. Because it comes in all sorts of media, And listen, uh, you know, at at 12 years old, I didn't have a clue about anything. I just knew this. I'd always heard this my whole life. Well, you need to uh, accept Jesus in your heart so you can die and go to heaven. Accept Jesus in your heart so you can die and go to heaven. Accept Jesus in your heart so you can die and go to heaven. That sounds a little morbid. You're like, accept Jesus so I can die and then go to heaven. You know, uh, and I know that we teach children this, but listen, we need to change this up a little bit. Jesus didn't come here so we could die. Jesus came here so we could live. Full, abundant life of joy and light. I didn't know what the water was because I didn't understand it. Hearing comes by faith. Hearing comes by the word. Amen. And so uh, I really was, had no clue. But I began to walk the paths of the evil one. Now listen, I want to tell you, I never drank, smoked, did drugs. 
But you know what I did do? Worship a lot of idols. All sorts of idols. I love music. I love comics. I was in the movies. I was a square. All my friends were too. I was such a nerd. But all those things are my idols. I remember the first day I went to Change Lives Ministries to lead a Bible study. And I was like shaking a little bit, nervous, because I, I didn't hang out with any guys like this. People, you know, you people, you know. I had never <laughs> hung out with you people before. I was so nervous. And, uh, and so I, I got there. I actually had some of my church staff just, uh, they grabbed my hand and we prayed. And this is like almost 15 years ago, everybody. This is almost 15 years ago. And I went there and I sat down. I was so nervous that we opened the Bible and we just had church. Yeah. I left there. I called my wife. And I, I said, honey, I have so much in common with a heroin, heroin addict. It's crazy. <laughs> and, uh, I've, I've, uh, and she said, never say that to anyone. <laughs> 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 Sorry. You know, <laughs> you know, but you know what I learned in that moment? Brokenness is brokenness. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't matter what shape it is. You see, when we come into this earth, we are already in a broken condition. And it comes from our great father, Adam. See, Adam, he was put in the perfect place. He was given the perfect partner, but he messed it all up because he did not look to God. He didn't turn his head to him. When God gave him this garden, it was absolutely immaculate and beautiful. It was where heaven and earth actually met. The tree of life was there. They could eat from it any day they wanted to. The only thing he told them not to do was not eat at this particular tree of the knowledge of what? Good and evil. Amen. Amen. And so, just like typical kids, the moment you find them next, they're hanging out by the tree. That they told them not to hang out. I don't know if y'all have ever played this game of, uh, this is sin. I'm not touching it. I'm not touching it. I'm not touching it. I'm right there, it's sin, but I'm not touching Do y'all do that with sin? Yes, we do. You play with fire, you get burned. The enemy has never changed his tactics. In Genesis 3, we find him as this snake, cunning creature. But he is far more malicious when we find him in Revelation as the dragon. I think the Bible is the most amazing book in the world. Amen. And things really didn't begin to come to vision in my mind until I began to read God's word when the spirit was involved. When the Spirit gets involved, I get so much from the Word of God. And I just want to share tonight what I have been through, through my journey on the Word of God. Some of y'all might have heard some of these things before, but I'm okay with that, because there's many who haven't. You know, in the very beginning, when it says in Genesis, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and a blackness covered the deep, and a wind swept over and then God spoke a word, and then he said what? Let there be light. You know what's absolutely phenomenal? Is in the first three verses of the Bible, we find God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. You're like, whoa, 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 wait a minute, Pastor. Where's God the Father at? Well, he's the creator. Where's God the Son? He spoke a word. In the beginning, there was the word, right. and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then the Word became flesh and lived among us. Amen. 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 In the very beginning, and He spoke the word light. Jesus said that I am the light of the world. You know, He turned it around, though. He looked at all these broken Israelites, and He looked at them in their poverty and in, their, uh, in the cruelty that they were living in. And he, he looked at them and said, you are the salt of the earth. Yep. You are the light of the world. Right. Amen. Yeah. Jesus makes us shine. So in the first three verses of the Bible, we find God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And then it says in verse 26, let us make mankind in our image. Amen. Amen. This is absolutely amazing because God is revealing to us right from the beginning that there is much more about me than you could ever understand. But I'm going to slowly reveal it to you. The Bible is the only ancient text that has an expanding science to it. Yeah. it it's It's beautiful. Listen, don't hate science. God made it. There's no science bigger than God. 
It's absolutely phenomenal how God reveals himself in Scripture. You know, the, the Bible is the only one that had it right the, uh, in the very beginning. The dome of the waters and the dome of the cloud. It says in uh, Job that they saw the circumference of the horizon. Listen, the Bible knew the world was round way ahead of anyone else. And they say that the ancient Greeks figured out in about 5 BC that the world was round. Wow, they were really late on that one. <laughs> Amen? God, he made it round way longer than they figured it out. And he revealed it through his word. We also see in his word that after a, a, catastrophic, a catastrophic event called the flood, you see it never rained before then, but after it rained, what did he put in the sky? A rainbow. Christians, in the actual Hebrew, rainbow means weapon of war. Amen. God hung his weapon of war up. He says, I will not destroy the earth like that again. It will not be water, but listen, it will be fire next time. Yeah. You know, 10 is a big number in the Bible. We always think about 7 to 40. But you know, it was actually 10 times God spoke and created in Genesis and then we find he speaks ten times in Exodus when he destroys Egypt. I think that's interesting. We find in the generations from Adam to Noah, ten generations. And then we find from Noah to Abraham, ten generations. I think that's really interesting because when Abraham came, God chose him. And from him, all the nations of the world would be what? Blessed. Blessed. Amen. Blessed. And so, Christians, I think this is phenomenal how that word, uh, that, that number 10 pops up. You know, he gave a law, and how many, law, uh, how many commandments? How many of y'all broke? I'm kidding. No. You don't answer that. Amen. Ten commandments. If you look at all of the earth and how they do laws and regulations, guess what? You can always tie it back to the ten commandments. I love it. The Bible is so amazing. The next time we see ten pop up in a very traumatic order is when the beast comes with ten horns in Revelation. Christians, do you believe that Jesus is coming back? Yes. Why are we not living like it? That's right. Come on, man. Come on, preacher. If Jesus, if we really believe Jesus is coming back, why are we not living like it? Like a church with urgency. Do you not have people that you love who don't know Jesus? I have people that I desperately love who have not received the Lord, and actually, it's as if they have a wall against it. Can, can I, amen? Anybody else with, the, with me there? And I've discovered that, as I, I've told my, my people, I wish we could just like, like hit someone over the head with a Bible and drag them over to Jesus, Amen. I wish we could do it like that, but it's not like that. Amen. A lot of love and prayer is put into it. I want to tell you that where I got, it was because of the love and relationship my parents built into me and the life and the foundation that they built for me to stand on. And I know that I'm blessed. I'm so blessed because many children did not have what I had because I had a dad who had the most perfect fatherly love because whether you believe it or not, the first encounter kids ever have with God is their parents. That's, right. That's the first encounter they ever have. And I just want to tell you, if you experienced a God that forsook you, if you experienced a God who abandoned you, listen, that's not my God. That's not my Heavenly Father. My Heavenly Father loves you so much, He's going to break the world for you. And He's going to give us a brand new one. Christians, we must have urgency. But I know that God knew what I would be before I ever took my first breath. He said that in, to Jeremiah in the very beginning of the, the prophecy. He said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you before you were born. I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. And when Jeremiah came, they didn't like what he said. Nope. Amen. And, and listen, you might not always like what your preacher says. But if it's in the word, you better listen. Amen. I think some of us like to cherry pick God's word. And it's like, yeah, I like that. No, I don't like that. Love my enemies. Are you, do you know my enemies? Yes. 
love your enemies. Pray for those who hurt you. Amen? Look at this prophecy with me again. Look at verses 1 through 3 again in chapter 2. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Go and proclaim in the hearing of who? Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord, I remember your devotion in your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness in a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. All who ate of it were held guilty. Disaster came upon them, says the Lord. God is saying, I protected you. I took care of you as a husband would take care of a wife. He's talking about how it used to be. How many of y'all remember when you were young? Oh, man. <laughs> Hit a nerve, you know, man. And probably a pinch nerve that, that, at that. Amen. And uh, but you remember when you were young. I remember when I first began to follow Jesus, how on fire I was for his word. At 17, I began to just preach and speak. I would speak anywhere that they let me at 17 years old. I would, and sometimes I was like, man, that was really bad. You know, but, <laughs> but I just kept on because I knew I had a calling in my life. And I kept on stepping out and I kept on preaching God's word. I just had a fire about me. I wanted to know more and more and more and more about God's word until I just was trying to figure him out and who I was supposed to be. And that's where our identity comes from. We have a world that everyone doesn't know who they are. We have a world that people don't even know what gender they are anymore. And I, I don't mean to uh, criticize or hurt anyone's feelings. But if you really believe in science, science says that there are two genders. Amen. Because that's science. If science ever has an agenda behind it, it's not science anymore. God created them male and female. And here I am, I was young in, in the, the, the 90s and early 80s, and I was trying to figure out whether or not I wanted to be a ninja or a dinosaur. <laughs> You know, I mean, I was just like, this is a time of innocence, you know? And we have all this indoctrination going on through so much multimedia and questioning because we have, we have lost who we were in him. He is where we get our identity from. And as Adam, his image was broken because of sin. We bear the broken image of Adam but I have very good news. Jesus came to restore your image Amen. in God. He makes you brand new, a new creation in Christ Jesus. Amen. And he does this. I'm an example of that. Because at uh, my mid-teens, I began to be very angry with God. Have you ever been angry with God? I would yell and scream at him and curse at him and say, you don't exist. At the age of 15 and 16, I was so mad at him. You see, I had a family member and a friend who was taken from us. And if you've ever experienced loss or hurt, especially at a young age, you don't really know how to respond to that. But I responded in anger and aggression at the only one I really could blame because no one was ever brought to justice for what they did to this young lady. And it just made me so mad. And so I would pray all these awful things towards the people who did that to them, to her. And then I, I would uh, just lift up all these blasphemous things to God, just yell at him at 15 and 16, a whole year of my life, given the darkness. I never hurt anybody, but I certainly hurt myself. You know, don't you love people who never give up on you? My, my sister gave me this Bible in 1999, a, a Christmas she said it's from your favorite sister. <laughs> it's my only sister, but that's all right. I do love her. She's my favorite. And she highlighted just a few verses, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 through 18. And she highlighted, and in the whole Bible, she highlighted these. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. And give thanks in all circumstances for Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. And, and uh, I said, really? Come on, uh, it made me even more mad when she gave me the Bible. And, and I read that and I was like, huh. Threw it to the side. 
And then she said, well, come to this winter camp thing. And I'm like, ah, I don't know about that. She said, yeah, but this really cute girl's going, all right, all right, man, that's a good idea, man. Yeah, all right, all right. As, she was cute. I went, but she wasn't into me. So I, I thought winter camp was going to be awesome, but it wasn't. But I went for the wrong reasons. Just like many of us go to the church for the wrong reasons. Like many of us serve him for the wrong reasons. But I went, and I slept the whole first service. I was so tired. I was like, you know, a miserable 16-year-old. I didn't want to be there, really. I slept through the whole first service. The next day, though, they had this actor from Florida. He stood up there. It was just a stool in himself, and he portrayed the role of Barabbas. Now, if you don't know who Barabbas is, Barabbas was actually a horrible thief and murderer who was at the bottom of the prison and Pilate saw Jesus and he knew that Jesus did not deserve to die and so he got the worst of the worst criminal out of the prison and put before the people to set one of them free and he was probably had in his mind like a great idea it's like oh of course they're going to choose to set Jesus free because Barabbas is horrible and they put this horrible murderer beside Jesus who taught love your enemies and this guy who was killing people and he looked at the Jews and he's like hey who would you like to set free for this festival and they yelled out Jesus Barabbas because if you don't know in Matthew's old text Barabbas's name is Jesus Jesus Barabbas. You know what Barabbas means? Son of the Father. So here we have Barabbas, son of the Father, and here we have Jesus, son of the Father. We have Jesus over here, Jesus right there, and they chose the wrong Jesus, and we still choose the wrong Jesus. Amen. We have idols in our life that we need to tear down. Amen. We have built religion in our lives that we need to cast aside. Because God is not what you do. God is who you are. Amen. Jesus is not what you do. Jesus is who you are. We are the church. For too long we've been going to the church though. And we've not been taking church with us when we leave. That's why many children are growing up in houses. And when they graduate high school, they leave the home and they leave church. Because you never did church at home. Men, where are you at? Where are you at? We have a generation of boys. A generation. Raising boys, raising boys. As God says here in this next part, when we read chapter, uh, verse 9 and 10, he says, therefore, once more, I curse you, says the Lord. I curse your children's children. Does it not seem like our children's children are living under a curse today? Amen. And it's curses that we have began in our own lives. It's brokenness that we have passed on. It's things that we have allowed in our lives to continue and continue without stopping it. And it just goes to the next generation. There are children who are four times removed from the church. That means that their great-great-grandparents may have went to church. I met two kids on Mail Route Road who had never been to church, had never even heard of Jesus on Mail Route Road, they came to the basketball. They were just playing basketball. I went out to them. I was like, hey, how you guys doing? And they were like, yeah, we're fine. Leave us alone. I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know, all right. So I went back into my office, and, you know, it was summer, so they got hot. So they came in for water. And then they sat down in my office like they owned it. It was so funny. And uh, there's like one was 10 and one was 8, and they were just sitting there. We were talking, and they looked at a picture on my wall, and it was Jesus praying in the garden. And they said, who's that man? Is that God? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> I'm so glad you asked. Yeah, it is God. It's God's son. And I gave the whole gospel presentation to them, and I gave them some things to look at, and then they left. Then their dad came. See, they were from New York. And uh, not, not saying anything about New York. My sister lived there for eight years. I went up there one time. I'm never going back. You know, and I, you know, amen. But the, the dad came and he goes, what trash are you telling my kids? And I was like, well, I'm actually telling them about a God who created and gave them to you. And he goes, yeah, but we don't do that. And he drove off. You know, about three years after that, they came to a vacation Bible school. And I got to meet their mom. 
and their mom said that they were going to church now. Isn't that like, right? You know? It's amazing how great gospel evangelist children can be. You know why? Because they don't fear anything. And as we get older, we begin to fear everything. And some of us let fear rule our lives, and it takes the once passion that we had for Jesus, and it becomes this docile flower. Listen, Jesus did not call us to be safe. Jesus said, I send you out as sheep among wolves. Be innocent as what? Doves. And wise as what? Serpents. But some of us are innocent as serpents and wise as lambs. We have lost our passion. If you know that you've lost your passion, let's get it back. Let's get your passion back. You know, it, all it takes is to stop going to church one time, and then two times, then three times, and we've had a whole year where you could just bow out of church. Amen? It's like, oh, we're worshiping at home. No, you're not. I know you're sitting there watching the service eating spaghetti. I know. But listen... <laughs> You know, uh, I just think there's power when we come together and worship together and do not church together, but be church together, amen? This is the power, man. That's where it has to be. And we have literally lived through a moment where many of us have had to make decisions whether I choose my health or safety. And I'm not trying to draw any kind of battle lines here or anything. Because you need to do what God tells you to do. Amen. You need to follow His Spirit. Right. And His Spirit told me, Chris, I know the world shut down, but keep going. Right. Keep Amen. preaching. Amen. Keep teaching. Amen. Keep witnessing. Amen. Keep loving people. I think some of us just, when we leave the church doors, we hit our Christian uh, clock out button. <laughs> Amen. All right, I'll catch it up next time. How many of you have ever said, well, I've done my good deed for today? Yes. No, that's not good. You just did one? <laughs> Amen. You see, when God's spirit gets inside of you, you can't help but to love like him. And if something's stopping up that love, then there's something wrong there. And the Holy Spirit wants to get a hold of it. Because he wants to restore in you a pure, fiery love for him. And so what's really wrong with the church today is that, listen, if the home isn't right, the church will never be right. Men, where are you at? Where are you at, men? The first question God ever asked Adam was, where are you? And that's the same question countless women and children have asked. Where is my dad? Where is my husband? Men of God, where are you? There's some guys out there who really need a father figure because they don't have a dad. I was so blessed with the love that God surrounded me with so that I would know how love should look, so that I could know how to give that love to others, so that I could raise up children. And listen, I, I'm so scared to death. I'm about to have a teenager. <laughs> it's so frightening. Because I literally, I feel like I was just a teenager. How is this possible? What's, this is crazy. And I'm, I am a little, I pray a lot. It's changed my prayer life. It has. You know, I know a lot of you guys, you know, sharpen your blades and look at your bullets. But I'm talking to the living God. <laughs> because he has our whole life in his hands. And I am praying for a godly man for my daughter godly men for my daughters. I'm praying for that. What are you praying for? I think some of us become uh, or come to God like he's a genie. I need this, I need that, I need that, I need this. And we get in the if I only had syndrome. Listen, when I was young, the reason why I had so much problems, young people, any young people here tonight? When I was 15 and 16, I had so much teen angst, all this things going on. Listen, I need you to hear this. If you're out there listening to this, I didn't think I was anybody unless I was with somebody. And that's the most toxic thing you could ever think about yourself. Because you are putting your worth into the opinion of another person. 
And they don't have that right to tell you what you are. Because I know a God who made you and who said who you are. He died to show you what you meant. And we live in a culture that tries to bend us and break us to this mold of what beauty is, and it has no idea what beautiful is. Amen. Jesus was beautiful. Amen. How beautiful are the feet who bring the gospel. I didn't think I was anybody unless I was with somebody, and that's such a toxic thing to think. And God really didn't get that straightened out until I found my identity in Him. And then He led me to the right one. He brought her into my life. I met my wife at the church that I'm pastor at now. Now listen, I wasn't pastor then, okay? I was like 17 years old. She, first night she came to the youth group, I walked right up to her and I was like, hey baby, no, I didn't do that. I, no, I, was, I didn't do that. I, I probably barely said my name. I was like, hi, my name is Chris, you know, and uh, my, my voice was probably so wobbly, you know? But, uh, you know, we just became friends, and we were friends for like a year before we even tried to date, because in my mind, I'd already made some dumb mistakes and dumb decisions and dumb relationships, even by the age of 16. And I was like, I ain't doing that again. There's nothing more hurtful than a broken heart. Is that true? Man, a broken arm heals easy, but a broken soul and wound, whew, takes a while. And so I wanted to do everything that was pleasing to him, and pleasing to him, even in this, any relationship, even in a friendship. The, when I came to Christ, I lost a lot of friends. Yeah. Not that they didn't like me anymore, but I pulled back. Because I was not strong enough to pull them up. I was just enough strong enough for them to pull me down. And it's so much easier to be pulled down than to pull someone up. So I just withdrew for a while until I felt strong enough to be a witness and Christians, uh, me and Jamie had such an amazing friendship. I, I want to tell you what makes an awesome marriage is just being best friends. Amen. Yeah, that's the secret of marriage, being best friends. Just be best friends. You know what best friends do? Finish, finish each other's sentences. You know why? Because they spend time together. <laughs> they like talking stuff, you know? Have you, you men ever talked in things? You know? Don't worry, men. I'm going to get on the ladies in a second. Amen. Uh, I'm, I'm going to get in trouble. But I think the scariest thing ever, because I not only met Jamie at the church, I asked her to marry me at the church, and then we got married at that church, and now I pastor that church. Amen. I just think that's really neat, you know. So cool. You know, um, and it's amazing because Victory Baptist Church was actually a church plant from Providence Baptist Church. Now, it was, this is the church plant that happened. It was when one person was mad at the other person, and they went across the street. <laughs> That's how Baptists have been planting churches for years. The wrong way. Amen? We're like, oh, I'm mad at you, I'm mad at you, I'm starting my own church. And they literally, a group of them went across to the fire department, and my parents were young. They were very young at the time, and they, they went with that crowd that left. And a, a, a beautiful man... Uh, Man, uh, he, he donated land uh, for us to have a church over there on mail route. His name was Bill Lewis, and some of y'all might remember him. He's an amazing farmer, amazing man, great son, his son Sheldon. And so that's where the church was birthed. It was birthed from what? Disaster. Isn't God still a God who uses disaster and makes something beautiful? Because I, I just want to ask, how many of you have been affected because Victory Baptist is a church? I mean, how, how many of you have been affected, you know? How many of you out there? There's some rough things that are going to happen in your life, some horrible things. But you know what? God can still use it. What the enemy meant for evil, God means for good. Amen. The scariest conversation I ever had with Jamie was when I realized that God was calling me into ministry. And I was so scared to death to have that conversation with her because I kept on playing in my head and my heart, what if she doesn't want to marry a pastor? Or a I didn't even want to be a pastor at the time. I just wanted to be in ministry. I wanted to do music ministry. <laughs> or maybe youth ministry. That's fun. 
Pastoral ministry, that's the dark side. I didn't want to, you know, <laughs> get involved with that. Amen? But I just looked at her and I was like, I, I feel called in the ministry. And she, I didn't know this, but she was just as nervous because I asked her, hey, I have to talk to you about something important. Can we have dinner? And, and I didn't know this, but inside of her, she was like, he's going to break up with me. You know? <laughs> Because I don't know if you guys noticed that, but men and women, we really communicate very differently. We understand very differently. And so we had the most amazing conversation because she told me, well, God already told me that I would marry someone in ministry. And she has been so supportive. Because I don't know about you guys, if y'all know this, I'm high maintenance. <laughs> I am. I'm super high maintenance, you know. And um, a man will leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife. Amen. That word cleave means chase. And there's some of you men who haven't chased your wives in a long time, and that needs to change. Because a lady wants to be chased. Ladies, you want to be chased? Yeah. Amen. Woo, yeah. Amen. It says to chase. Cleave means to chase. Run after them. That's how you caught them. And I know some of you are like, man, why'd I do that? But listen. <laughs> right? Amen. You're to chase them. When you catch him, and this old fella, he took me by the neck, and he goes, boy, you want to know how to keep that woman? I was like, please don't tell me. <laughs> you know, please don't. I never know what some of you old men's going to say. And he said, boy, if you want to keep her, keep doing all the things you did to catch her. I was like, that's a good idea. He was married five times, though. You know, and so, uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, I didn't know how to take it, you know. But you know what? Wisdom comes from God. It's up to us to do with it as we choose. Amen? And so that was good wisdom. And so, yes, we should chase our wife. And ladies, I just want to throw this out there. Kind of give them something to chase sometimes, you know? <laughs> the most, you know, you know, I, you know, just, you know, you know what I'm saying? I, I think it's a double-edged sword, you know? Just like the Word of God. If you use God's Word to swing it at something, maybe you should swing it at yourself first. Amen? A man will leave his father and mother be, and cleave into his wife, and they too shall be one, what? Flesh. Now this just isn't, isn't on the physical sense. This is knowing your partner. And, and men, what we have trouble with is intimacy. You know what would drive your lady crazy? Like make her heart race? Is that you just turn to her and say, hey, Let's talk. <laughs> oh, man. Let's talk. Man, it would just drive them crazy. And man, if we would just learn how to communicate. And the end of chapter 2 of Genesis is beautiful because after uh, God says this to Adam, he says, and they were both naked and unashamed. And Christians, in marriage, you can still capture a glimmer of the Garden of Eden. And they were both naked and unashamed. That means your partner can see all of you, inside and out, and love you for you. That's called transparency. What the enemy hates is transparency. The enemy wants secrets, lies, and walls. He uses that to perfection. Because he wants to isolate you from all those who really love you. From all those who will really accept who you are, even though you're broken, even though you have problems, even though you got some gaps. Listen, we all got brokenness. We've all got gaps. We've all got problems. And Jesus is what? The answer. He teaches us how to love each other. Amen? Amen? That's, that's where it's at. He teaches us how to love. And so in marriage, you can actually capture that transparency. And, and what the enemy would love to do to any marriage and any friendship or any church is to bring in walls, deception, and judgment. That's right. I'll show you what a healthy church looks like. A healthy church will always have a high level of transparency. That people can show their brokenness and be not on their guard. And the only way to achieve that is to have a high level of grace. Yeah. That's the only way. If there's little grace, there'll be little transparency and little change. No transformation. Because everybody's wearing a happy mask. How are you doing, brother? Fine, I'm great. 
even though you yelled at your family all the way there. <laughs> Amen? I'm great. Nothing will ever change unless some brokenness happens. God wants to break us and reshape us into his image to make us new. And I, I said all this to get to this point right here. Because the analogy here in this prophecy is of a husband and a wife. The Bible begins with a marriage, it's going to end with one. Because the bridegroom will come for his bride. Amen. And he has done everything needed to make us stand before him. Unblemished, justified, holy, he's done it all. You know what is demanded of us? Faith. If you have faith in something, you're going to obey it. If you have faith in something, you're going to love it. Faith is the fuel that we need. You know what fuels faith? Obedience. None of us can ever live a perfect life. I'm so thankful God hasn't asked us to. He's asked us to live an obedient life. I can do obedience, amen? Because there will be times in our lives where you will try to make your own cistern to drink from. And the biggest problem with American church today is we're making a lot of cisterns to drink from. We're doing a lot of things, but we're not drinking from the source. That's right. Amen. Amen. The Word is what we really need. Amen. We need to return back to the Word. <laughs> when we depart from the Word, we depart from Him who gave us the Word. And if I didn't have everything in place in my life with some things that have happened to me in ministry. See, I, I've been in ministry since I was 23 years old. I got married at 22, went in the ministry at 23, like full-time. And, uh, well, I was, I was part-time paid, but there's no such thing as part-time ministry. There's such thing as part-time pay, but there's, there's no such thing as uh, full-time. Amen. There, there's... Only full-time ministry. If you're in ministry, you're in ministry. And when I asked my dad, I was like, Dad, I feel like I'm called into ministry. And he goes, are you for real? And I was like, yeah. And he said, all right. And he was so supportive. He says, the thing you have to understand is that you cannot halfway this. You can't halfway this. Christians, you can't halfway being a Christian. Amen. Ladies, what if I told you that your husband was 85% faithful to you? Would you be cool with that? No. How much, how much percentage do you want faithful? 100 How much do you think God wants from his church? 100%. Amen. But we've been drinking from very cesterns, crack cesterns that we've made for ourselves. To put it in a better light. When Elijah faced all the prophets, the false prophets, on Mark, Mount Carmel, amen, he let them do their thing, and then it was his turn. And so what he did was he prepared the sacrifice. He was going to burn it. But he says, wait a minute, let's down this with some water. And they're like, well, yeah, let's do that. Because I don't know if you know that, anything wet doesn't burn very easily. Amen. And so he said, well, let's dunk it one more time. Amen. Well, let's do it one more time until it was just covered in water. Elijah did everything, being obedient to God. He did everything possible so this would not ignite. Right. And here we are rubbing two sticks together to get something going. When God, when he brings the fire, it is lit. Yeah. What we've been doing is what we can do. What if we as a church begin to try to do things only God can do? That's where faith really comes in. I have uh, this brown tie. No one has said that it clashes. I think it clashes a little bit. But I had two great mentors in my life. One was a man named Dan Luff. And uh, I was right there when he went to heaven. Died of a heart attack. He was such a good man. And uh, I miss having, like, someone 
you know, I fit right underneath his armpit. It was crazy, you know. <laughs> he just hugged me. And, uh, but it, his wife gave me this tie, so I wear it. it. Brown does not go good with a lot of things, all right? None of the things I have, it goes with. But I wear it because I'm reminded of his love that I'm essentially clothed in the love that he had for me. Being clothed in Christ's love is not always going to look good to the world. It might make you look awkward and weird, but it's what is needed. Amen? So ladies, I, I want to pick on you just for a minute. Uh, there's three types of ladies that strain a marriage. I'm going to get in trouble. All right, men, are you ready for this? They are smart. They didn't say a word. Uh, the constant nag. That's the lady who grabs onto something and will never let it go. And she will get on you until you do it. Then there's the kind insulter. That's the one who can destroy you by saying it so sweetly. <laughs> and, uh, and a lot of you women have this talent to where you'll just say the most pretty thing, but it's awful. <laughs> you'll say, oh, that's a nice dress. It has got pockets, right? You'll kind of, you know, you'll just, I, I'm picking up on some of the things you'll do. And, uh, well, bless your heart, right? You know? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, and then there's the boss lady. This is the one who has the explosive anger if you step out of line. I'm just going to say this. In a marriage, you're the bride. And Paul, he gave a beautiful scripture in Ephesians that we are to submit ourselves to one another in the fear of the Lord. Right. Wives, be submissive to your husbands as is good for you. And the reason why this is, is so that there will be peace amongst you. It says, wives, love your husbands. No, it doesn't say that. It says, wives, respect your husbands. That's right. And it says, men, love your wives. Oh Amen. That's what it says. Because us men, we feel love when we feel respected. If we feel disrespected, we don't feel love. Because that's how we're wired. But you know what, men, there's some of you out there, you're the absent man. You're never there. And when you are, you're not there still. Your mind is somewhere else. They're sitting there pouring their heart out to you, and you're just going, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, okay, yeah. And then the dreaded thing comes, what did I just say? Yeah. Amen. There's no multiple choice. You either get it or you don't. Then there's the ever silent man. They never say anything especially when it's needed. Adam, he said nothing when it mattered. That's right. And Eve fell into sin. And then there's the ever angry man. They're just always angry, angry about something. I want to tell you that Jesus brings in a love to your heart that changes all of that. Amen. And if you would love each other as Jesus, amen, love the church. It says, husbands, love your wives as Jesus loved the church. What did, what did Jesus do for the church? He died for it. How many of you men would die for your wife? Yeah. You die for your wife. Are you going to do them dishes? <laughs> you know? Amen? Are you going to take the trash out? I, I learned so much. When we were just married a month, we went to a marriage retreat, and uh, this sweet couple in their 70s stood up and gave a testimony. And that old fellow, he had just received the Lord three years ago. It's never too late. And that little lady said, my world's changed. He's nice. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. I think Jesus makes a difference. And she says, I just, I can't get over how he's changed. He even helps me mop. <laughs> and um, that's when it turned a little bit, because I'm 23 years old at the time at this marriage retreat. And that like 70-something-year-old woman said, when he mops, that makes me hot. <laughs> like, uh, like, uh, like, uh, oh, man. 
And that old man said, I'm a mopping fool. Uh, you know, it's, uh, man, uh, oh my goodness, you know, uh, ooh, man, wow. So uh, that's when I realized it just doesn't stop. You know, it just doesn't stop. You see, Jesus, he loved us so much that he did all the little things. Jesus did, didn't just come here and die. Jesus came here and lived. Your life isn't yours. It's God's. Your life is for everyone else around you. And do you understand that what you do with your life affects so many people that love you? Jesus came, he lived for us. And listen, the whole time he was living for us, guess who was after him? The enemy, the accuser, the one who accuses us a night and day before our God. He accuses you. And listen, he doesn't have to make up evidence. He brings the real stuff. Because I don't know if you know this, but we're kind of terrible. He brings the real deal. Jesus goes into the wilderness, spends time with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They're all in this one moment fasting, getting close to one another. He was filled with the Spirit, led with the Spirit, empowered with the Spirit, and they're just worshiping together, and the devil came right up in the midst of that. And you think he's not going to come up in your home? You think he's not going to come up into your marriage? You see, there wasn't three in the marriage in the beginning. There was four. It was God, Adam, Eve, and the enemy. Yeah. And some of y'all have the fourth man in the marriage. Jesus did all the little things. And the whole time, the enemy was trying to get Jesus to sin. Because someone asked me, well, Chris, if the devil knew what the cross is going to do, why did he do any of that? And I was like, listen, the devil didn't know anything. The devil didn't know. The devil doesn't know the depths of God or his love, and the devil does not know you. That's right. He knows your weakness, but he does not know greater than he. Amen. That's right. And I've come to a point where I just want to wreck his plans. Because he has plans for you to wreck you, and I want to wreck his plans. I want to take what he's taken from me, and I want to take way more than he's ever taken from me. Amen. I want to wreck his plans. Are you living like Jesus is coming back? Because Jesus, he is coming back. He's coming back for his bride. You're the bride. You, you're the bride. Let's stand up for a minute, amen. We're going to go to a time of invitation. And uh, I just want to say a few words more and, uh, and just have prayer. The devil couldn't get Jesus to sin in the wilderness. And so he left him for an opportune time. We don't know all the moments in the Bible where the enemy came after our Redeemer. But can you believe that he came after Jesus time and time and time again through all those Pharisees, through all the trial and struggle on the road and the cities? Don't you believe that the enemy was after him, trying to get Jesus to sin. Even while he's in the wilderness praying for us, interceding for sinners like us, praying for our salvation in his most awful moment, he's sweating blood, amen? He said, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass. But not my will, yours be done, amen? The enemy up until I believe Jesus was on the cross, was waiting for Jesus to sin, and he never sinned. He did that for you. And so what I believe that God would like us to do as a church is to live for him. Amen. Some of y'all are, are married, amen? And some of y'all are not. I can tell the difference. I'm looking at you. you know. Some of y'all are happy. You know. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. Amen. Just kidding. But I just want to tell you that when Jesus becomes the master of the marriage, it's good. Men, where are you at? They're, they're going to begin an invitation. If God leads you, you come. You know, last night we stayed two hours, you know. There's some relationships that you need to mend, but it starts at the altar. 
There are some of us men who need to go home and, and say sorry. There are some of uh, you ladies who need to admit just one time in your entire life, I was wrong. <laughs> Amen. Just once. Amen. And make Jesus the master of the marriage. Because men of God, He wants you to be the spiritual leader of your home and to wash your family with the Word of God. Amen. I love you all so much. Would you pray with me one more time? Father, thank you how you move and work. Father, if there's someone here tonight and they just want to restore some relationships in their life that have not been good in a long time, Father, might you move and work in a powerful way. And Lord, uh, during this invitation, Father, if there's anyone who is just, uh, as we did last night, looking for a fresh anointing, Father, might they come, Lord, that they would receive your precious Holy Spirit and they would walk in power. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If God is leading you, you please come.
Thank you. 
You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. There's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you lord there's nothing nothing is better than you you turn groan into dancing you turn beauty for ashes you turn shame into to glory you're the only one who can you're the only one who can you turn graves into gardens you turn bones into armies you turn seas into highways you're the only Some breakthroughs here tonight. Amen. Does that make you happy? Amen. Amen. Uh, some breakthroughs. Amen. Uh, they're going to play a little bit more, but surely there's someone else who's looking for a breakthrough. I know you've been hiding in the crowd for a while. You might have been to a few of our services that we've done, and, and you've just slipped by every time when God was talking right to you, and you said, no, that's not me. But yeah, it's you. You might want that breakthrough. If you've never made a public profession of faith, now is the time. And you're not doing it for anyone else except the king who declared what you're worth. He came and he lived for you. He died for you. He rose again so that you could have newness of life in this moment. If that's you, if I'm talking to you, you're tired of living in shadows and darkness and deception and walls and chains. You want freedom. If that's you, you know it. Just come and receive what God has died to give to you. Because my brother, he's breaking through something right here. I might be a Baptist, but I know what I see when I see it. Amen. Amen. It's the Lord. Clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice. All the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in 
in light and darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice trembles at his voice how great is our God sing with me how great is our God and all will see how great how great is our God age to age he stands and time is in his hands beginning and the end beginning and the end the god had three in one the father spirit and son the lion and the lamb the lion and the lamb
Do you feel God's presence in this house tonight? Amen. Oh, man, give, give the Lord a hand. Amen. 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 Um, thank you all so much for just being in agreement with what's happening here. Because we're really on God's time. And they need to work through some things. Amen. And there's some things that we ourselves, amen, need to work on. Amen. Uh, continue to be in agreement in just this moment. And pray, pray for them right now. Pray for them right now. Wherever you are, just start praying. Praying for them right now. Lord Jesus, God, as they are meeting with you, Lord, heaven is reaching down while we reach up. And God, we ask that you would just be in agreement with the desires of their hearts, Lord, that you are conforming them to your image. You're conforming them to your desire, your will. Lord, you are changing and transforming their entire future, Lord, because of what they are submitting and surrendering over to you. God, might we absolutely surrender to you in all these things, Father. Thank you so much for what you're doing in their life. Yes, Lord, we pray to you. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called blood flows through my veins. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of
Amen. Uh, how many of y'all feel free? Thank you, Jesus. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Amen. Jesus is alive. Amen. When he died, he wasn't dead long. Praise God. And there's some of us who've been living dead lives. And he wants to breathe life into you. There's some things that you thought that were dead for a long time. But God's going to breathe life into that. There's some relationships and some things that have been broken a long time. God's going to breathe life into that. And there are some decisions that have been made tonight that God's going to breathe life into. And so I just want to praise what he's done tonight. And uh, Brother Michael, come here, man. Come here. Jonathan, sorry. That's your brother. And, um, <laughs> but uh, I want you to pray for my brother here. Just ask that God will continue to give him strength Amen. and renewal. He's made a, a huge decision and breakthrough in Jesus tonight. So give God Woo! praise for him. <laughs> look, look, look at all these people. You know, uh, are y'all going to like seriously pray for this man? Yeah. Amen. All right. They're going to pray for you, man. And I'm going to pray for you. Y'all know we're cousins. We just look alike. And, uh, I know that. We, no, no, we are. I have to, you know, stand on the stool and all that, but that's all right. You know, but yeah, we are family. We're family. We're the same size now. Amen. And, and, and listen, we have family. You have family. What a, what a beautiful night. Go and get your family back from the enemy. Amen. Amen. Go and get your family back. Now listen, you're not going to be able to club them on the head. Amen. But what you can do is bring Christ in the home. Read the word of God. Read it out loud. Pray. Pray out loud. The enemy still trembles at the name of Jesus. So say his name at home. Amen. I love you all so much. Uh, we're, we're winding down now, but I just want to ask you all, have you felt God tonight? Amen. 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 I love you so much, man. Thank you so much. And, uh, so, so please, uh, I, I just would ask, that's my Aunt Priscilla right there. I love her. Y'all give Aunt Priscilla a, a hand clap. Amen. I, I like her, man. And, uh, she's a really cool lady. Amen. prayed we'd have a changed America. Amen. We would. We would have a changed America. What you can do for me is please come back tomorrow night, our, our final night. Uh, Brother Jonathan Vaughn, he's going to bring the word of God. Amen. We're going to sing together again. And, and listen, I'm a Baptist boy. And look what happened tonight. It doesn't matter. If you're a Christian, you're his. Amen. I love you all so much. Uh, I'm going to dismiss us in prayer. And pastors, please go, go there and, and greet the people. Uh, and, and continue to lift up uh, Brother Chris Bamberg. He was a little down today, sick. And so uh, please, please pray for him and ask God that, uh, that he would just he'll have some strength for tomorrow. Amen. And so we'll have a, a good... Could we give Pastor Chris a hand tonight? Oh, no. <laughs> I don't like pedestals. I need them to stand, you know, but uh, I'll jump off, though. Amen. Uh, I'm just honored to be among you. Amen. Uh, let, let us pray one more time. Father, thank you for our community. Father, we're going to ask in the name that is above all names, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, might you break the chains of addiction here. Might you restore marriages and homes. Might you give a safe home to children, Lord, that they feel safe at night when they sleep, and Lord, that they have warm meals every day. God, that you would do this. And Lord, I'm going to ask that you would use the church to make the difference. God, might we rise up and do only what you could do. 
And we ask all this in the powerful name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our soon and coming King, all God's people say. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Amen. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I know. I got to get my stuff.